that it was something you you've done to make your child autistic. Mm. And I mean, I've met so many parents, especially women, who feel like it's their fault. I mean, it's something they ate, it's something they drank, it's a place that they went. It was the electricity, it was the vibrations, it was, and, um, you know, being religious and believing, you know, mm. in God. I've always believed that every single thing has a purpose, it has a reason. There's, um, you know, there's there's purpose in the pain, it's, it is value in the value. So for me, it's saying, hey, this you were you were destined to be his mom or his grandma um for your viewer i want her to know that too you're destined for this because self-care strategies for me mm -hmm. i get away i get away so like i would literally take a 24-hour trip somewhere <laughs> else arizona i mean colorado i'm in florida so i would just you know um pen and pad I'll, I'll travel, I'll do something, you know, like take a quick flight, be alone, or I'll just pen and pad. I'm a journal, I'm a journaler. I will write my feelings, my emotions, what I'm thinking. And I think for parents um, or family members who's dealing with that diagnosis, any kid on the spectrum, journaling has always helped me because no one can know how you feel. You know how you feel. God knows how you feel. And you can say any and everything that you're feeling at the moment. That's definitely self-care. And of course, I'm a woman. So like hair, nails, makeup, trying to like beautify myself is also a self-care strategy that I try to do quite, you know, like once or twice a month. Autism. Something we don't talk about enough. I know we have awareness, but today we have a special guest with us that's really going to help us understand autism and a child's independence and even from her own personal experience. So this is Autism Beyond the Diagnosis. This is Sean Heineman. And of course, I created this because I have two boys with autism. So I'm not the expert in here. I'm bringing in experts to help me learn as well. So we just all on this road together. Today's guest is a special needs educator. She is a mother of two. She has a bachelor's degree in elementary education and a master's of behavior analysis. She is qualified to teach early childhood, special education, and elementary education. She has a true passion for working with, with our young leaders, helping each child progress in all areas of their development. Everyone, welcome, Sharon Crew. How are you doing, Sharon? Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm great. Thank you for taking some time to be a guest on today with this series. It's been a great one so far. And when I got a chance to speak with you, I was definitely excited with your education as well as experience in this. Uh, I want to jump into this. If you have any questions for our guests, please ask them below and we'll get those to her. Can you share with us about sharing with Sharon? Um, sharing with Sharon is my nonprofit organization. I started back in 2021. My son was 18 months. I noticed he was delayed and I was that that first year, I was upset, I was angry, I was in denial, all the things that you can possibly think of. And after I got over that phase, I'm like, hey, I need some answers. I need something I can do to make it easier on myself, find resources. And I started sharing with Sharon because I was looking for resources and they were limited. I was looking for like that group of people who knew exactly what I was going through, but that was also limited. So I started sharing with Sharon. So of course I can share information. It was just a mother trying to share information, share what she knew, share what she found out in my process while I was navigating um, being an autism mom. Because you can work and do something for years, but once it's in your home, it's completely different. So sharing with Sharon is to bring clarity and understanding to all things autism. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it because uh, with, with my two boys, I have three. Um, our nine-year-old, he was diagnosed with ADHD and we just found this out maybe about almost a year ago. And so we kind of struggle with that. And even for myself personally, my wife is a nurse and she works with special needs kids. 
But for me, it took a while uh, to uh, come to the reality of it that, you know, my my boys actually have autism because our youngest, he have delayed speech as well. Uh, why do you believe, do you think most men or most dads maybe struggle with going through the process of actually having the child, your child diagnosed? Like, do you think men struggle with that? I think they definitely struggle with it. Yeah. And um, based off my studies and what I've learned, um, for every six boys, there's only one girl. So imagine if your little boy who you expect to play football, running, tackling, basketball, sports, you know what men think. We, um, Men are like dominant. They're the ones who are in control. And to know that they don't have that control or their son's not looking at them and their son's not following their direction or copying what they do, because that's typical. A typical child will follow what their fathers do. And being is mostly boys that we see being diagnosed, the father can't take that. It's really harder on a man being that is mostly boys and they don't, they can't see their son following in their footsteps or you can't see it in the in the midst of the diagnosis, in the midst of the delayed speech and midst of the misinterpretation of what they they may hear. You may be saying, let's go. They may be going in the opposite direction. So the fathers, it, I think, I believe it's just harder to, you know, take in and accept. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's tough, because I know a, a, a male friend of mine and his son, I believe, because now that I've, I've been around, around it for a little while, I can kind of pick up on some things. I can see that his child is is autistic, but he having he, he didn't come to the realization of it yet. Like, oh, no, he's good. And I was like, OK, you know, what can you say? Uh, I do believe that early intervention is is very important. And I want to talk about that later as well. But what were some of the biggest challenges you faced early in the early years of parenting uh, your child with autism? Because you have two. So does just one have autism or, or both? Yeah, my son has autism. He's four years old. My daughter's three. She doesn't have autism. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they were definitely watching her, trying to make sure she was meeting her milestones, in which she did. Mm -hmm. But for me, early on, I knew, of course, I was in the field. I've been a teacher's aide. I've been a unique aide. I've worked in the autism um, classrooms, just, you know, being aides until I finished with college and became an actual teacher. My goal initially wasn't to be a teacher for ASD kids. I just fell in love with ASD kids. So me, I'm going to work to see these kids work with them. And for me, my biggest challenges were accepting my son. I'm like, no, this can't be happening to me. Mm -hmm. He's my first child. I mean, like I wanted a baby. I really want, like I didn't want problems. And I think a lot of parents deal with that because we, we have so many things that we pre-plan. I'm a pre-planner. I plan out things that I want and how he's going to, you know, do these certain sports. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, he's six months. He's not babbling. He's not making sounds. He's mute. He's He prefers to look at letters than actual pictures. I'm like, okay, this doesn't make sense. And then at one, he still wasn't walking, still wasn't talking. Um, His cousins, you know, family, friends, they're like, kids that are six and seven months crawling and doing way more than my son. So I started to get, um, honestly, I started to get embarrassed. I was shame. I was like, what did I do wrong? I started to self doubt. I started to feel guilt. Like, what did I do wrong? What did I not eat? Was I eating healthy? Was I eating, you know, too many sweets? It was just so many things that were running through my mind. So I didn't want to say anything. I told his dad, his dad did the denial thing. No, 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 no. His dad was very defensive, like, no. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. 
And then I had to come, you know, face it. He is autistic. And I knew it prior to us even getting the eval done because he was delayed. He wasn't talking. He was a picky eater. He was stem, like spin around in a circle, but while he's sitting down or shake his head back and forth. So I knew all the st stemming, you know, protocol. I knew all the things that he was displaying. I just wasn't ready. And his father obviously wasn't ready. So that didn't help at all. And um, my friends, their kids wasn't doing it. My associates, my family members, their kids wasn't doing it. I've never saw it at home or in my family. So for me, it was like, and I never saw a kid that age. See, I'm working in an elementary school setting, not in a toddler preschool setting or an infant setting. So for me, it was just accepting the diagnosis and moving forward with getting the help that I needed, which I was very hesitant to do. Mm -hmm. I understood it. Understood. Uh, what are some self-care strategies that have been most effective for you as a parent of a child with autism? Self-care for me. Yes. Wow, I've never gotten that question. Mm -hmm. And I've done multiple interviews, so I absolutely love it. Um, self-care strategies for me, mm -hmm. I get away. I get away. So like I would literally take a 24 hour trip somewhere else, Arizona. I mean, Colorado, I'm in Florida. So I would just, you know, um, pen and pad. I'll, I'll travel. I'll do something, you know, like take a quick flight, be alone, or I'll just pen and pad. I'm a journal. I'm a journaler. I will write my feelings, my emotions, what I'm thinking. And I think for parents um, or family members who's dealing with that diagnosis, any kid on the spectrum, journaling has always helped me because no one can know how you feel. You know how you feel. God knows how you feel. And you can say any and everything that you're feeling at the moment. That's definitely self-care. And of course, I'm a woman. So like hair, nails, makeup, trying to like beautify myself is also a self-care strategy that I try to do quite, you know, like once or twice a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's good. Um, so I want to ask uh, this question. So uh, what's your current relationship status, if you don't mind me asking? I'm a single mom. OK, single mom. So how how do you go about dating uh, and, and having a child with autism? Like how do, how does that work for you? Do you find it difficult do you find people more like more accepting or more willing to come beside you and aid aid you? How like what does that look like for you? Um, that's so well, that's a great question. Um, I haven't been single for a very long time, okay. less than a year. So I haven't really been dating. I mean, I've communicated with people, talked on the phone, went out to dinner dates, and I'll tell them about, but I'll tell them about, you know, my organization. They probably know that I live, sleep, eat autism because that's what I do for a living also. So I think it's more so a sympathy or empathy type of thing. Like, wow, because when you think of autism, you think of they feel sorry for you. Yeah. Because when you think of autism, you think of a biter, a spitter, a stretcher. Mm -hmm. So I think in the dating world, that male or that female, for me, I think men are going to feel um, some type of empathy or sympathy for me. They're going to feel sorry for me because not only am I doing it at home alone, I'm doing it with no with no um, companion right there next to me, you know, because for some in the, in the past, I would say, hey, I need to take some time to myself. I go in another room. I leave the house. He's with his father. Now it's, you have to stick it out, Sharon. You have to be here, Sharon. You have to stay present, Sharon. So that's constantly being reminded to me, you know, as a single mom. And right now, I think it is a, a big struggle to date because, okay, my son needs me. My son is a nonverbal child. He's a spitter. He's a, sometimes he's a pincher, a biter. He gets mm -hmm. physical. So with that being said, you can't bring him around everybody until you're comfortable enough. And I haven't been in that space yet, 
But, um, you know, me thinking for the future, I do think they have to understand, you know, these what comes with it. Sometimes the behaviors change. The kid isn't going to automatically respond. So I think for for anybody dating and you have a child on the spectrum, we have to remember not everybody understands autism. Autism is fairly new mm -hmm. and it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult because they're not the typical child. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm not. I'm not able to like fully, you know, tell you about dating experiences, but I will say that I think I've received some type of sympathy or someone feeling sorry for me and what I have to deal with as a mother with a child with autism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I wanted to know how that process worked because uh, for, for my wife and I, I mean, we struggle like to try to make sure that we have quality time together, date night all those different things. We got to make sure that we have a sitter in place, whether it's family. And like you said, someone to at least understand uh, autism, you know, that they just can't be with anyone. And that's another thing. When you're dating, you're leaving your child with someone you trust. When you're communicating with someone, getting to know someone, even with just your friends, you have to remember hey, whoever my child is with has to understand my child or understand the things that my child is capable of, which, I mean, let me just give you a little briefing. Mm -hmm. He would get in the cabinet. He would get in the cabinet, go inside the cabinet. I don't know if it's because he that he likes to feel safe and alone. He doesn't like loud noises. So I've encountered where he would just walk, he would just crawl in the cabinet. And I'm like... What if someone's looking for No one's going to look in a cabinet. No one's going to look down below. They're going to look outside. They're going to look in the bathrooms, under the beds. But my son would typically want to go in the cabinets. And I think that's very scary. He's a loper, which means he will open the door and leave. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't like the setting, he doesn't like the noise. Even if he doesn't like the smell of our environment, he will open the door and try to leave. He's left before when he was younger. And that was with me as his mom. Mm -hmm. So I'm very cautious with who he's allowed to be with. Like you said, a sitter. That sitter has to understand, okay, he's nonverbal, but you got to know that he's hungry at this time. Mm -hmm. How do I know he's hungry? I can tell because he's spinning in this direction. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's so strategic and it's so much that, that you have to deal with and, and know and pay attention to with our mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Because we had to get uh, the, the child proof locks on the, on our doors. Uh, Cause our youngest, he, he's a runner and he's fast. Like <laughs> one time his aunt took him to a park and thought that she could just like walk with him. It didn't work like that. I mean, he was, I mean, he's fast. So, so we hold his hand whenever we take him anywhere, but from locking the doors uh, and he likes to, to be in tight spots. He likes to be in like, like you say, like the cabinet uh, or in a closet, you know, just these little confined spaces. I think he liked that pressure. And that pressure is so typical for children with autism. It's like a sensory input. So it's just like receiving a hug, just not from a human. So being in that tight space, the closet, even the laundry basket, I saw my son just sit in a laundry basket and I know it was closed in there. So I, I thought maybe it felt great in the cabinet. You can close it. No one sees you. Of course, he had his iPad at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I'm alone. So for me, it's just, I know, you know, this is this is his comfort. This is his safe space. But some people wouldn't know that. They wouldn't know he'll just run, you know, and that can be difficult for people to adjust to also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We have uh, um, someone who commented. Thanks for uh, commenting. Uh, they said my grandson was recently diagnosed as having autism, which is mild. And I'm still trying to stop thinking about his future. Life is hard. Uh, and adding this challenge is hard. I promise to walk through life with him. Um, so that was a comment. Thanks again for commenting. We uh, appreciate that. I hope this video helps you. This is uh, part three of our series. Uh, what are some common misconceptions about autism that you often encounter in your advocacy efforts? Um, misencounters that mm -hmm. that it was something you you've done to make your child autistic. Mm. 
And I mean, I've met so many parents, especially women who feel like it's their fault. I mean, it's something they ate. It's something they drank. It's a place that they went. It was the electricity. It was the vibrations. It was, and, um, you know, being religious and believing, you know, mm -hmm. in God, I've always believed that every single thing has a purpose. It has a reason. There's, um, you know, there's, there's purpose in the pain is it is value in the value. So for me, it's saying, Hey, this, you were you were destined to be his mom or his grandma. Um, for your viewer, I want her to know that too. You're destined for this because our challenges aren't meant to break us. They're meant to make us, make us stronger, make us wiser, make us more, you know, advocates in this world. Because if it wasn't for your son, you wouldn't start this podcast. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for my son, I would have never started this organization. And me and you together are doing something to help other people, yes. but we wouldn't be able to do that without, we wouldn't be able to do that without what we, we are experiencing and what we're encountering and what we're going through. So that misconception is it's my fault. Mm -hmm. I did something wrong. Every single thing that happens to us, I truly believe is for a purpose, your purpose to do this and help as many people as you can. And for me to do the same, um, another misconception um, I think I get is black and brown children aren't diagnosed with autism. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that is crazy. Yeah. I know you've probably gotten a lot of, you know, um, comments or, you know, questions about black and brown kids because I'm. I'm African American. I'm a black girl, so I've gotten so much feedback on. Um, I, I don't think so. I think that he's just being rude, or I think he's mm -hmm. deaf. I think he's just not paying attention. I'm like, we we are able to get autism. We're able to get things that other kids are able to get. It's not a Hispanic thing. It's not a Asian thing. It's not a black. Thing. It's not a, you know, it's not a white thing. This is just a diagnosis, just like, just like, um, you know, Down syndrome. It's mm -hmm. no, okay, um, only this type of race gets it. No, all races can get autism. And I don't want to say get because you can't catch it. It's a right. disorder. Right. It's not a disease. It's not mm -hmm. something you can catch. It's not something that you can avoid. It's not something I could have done to not be an autism mom. It's nothing I could have drank to not be an autism mom because, you know, I still haven't seen a real study that shows this is what truly happened and this is truly, you know, why. No, it's no why. Right. I mean, studies are still, you know, autism is fairly new, but it's no why, it's no race. Yeah. So I want to like throw that out, to, you know, throw that out now. It's no race thing. It's no black thing, white thing, Asian thing. Hispanic thing. It's just a it's just a disorder, yes. just like other things that, you know, people have down syndrome, paraplegic, mm -hmm. deaf, blind. I mean, it's just one of those one of those things that people can't avoid. And I don't think that um, we should label it, you know, by race. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. And, and like I said, I know this is kind of more of a newer thing and people still trying to grasp um autism uh because it was before it was called uh well, Asperger's well Asperger's is on the spectrum so it's okay. a part of autism um um, autism is the bigger word that they finally came up with, with the umbrella. So under that umbrella is so many different spectrums, ADHD, Asperger, um, I, it's, it's a list of different diagnoses under PDD, mm -hmm. um, DB, um, so many different diagnoses under the autism umbrella because your son may be download, um, diagnosed with ADHD, my son was diagnosed with PDD, they are under the autism umbrella. So some people say, well, he's not ASD, which is autism spectrum disorder, but he is. He's just under the umbrella. Asperger is under the umbrella of autism. So it's a broad word and all the kids are different based off the diagnosis or the things that they do that's different. Yeah. So for me, um, you know, I've saw it all. The defiance disorder, they do the complete opposite. There's yeah. PDD. They're just extremely delayed 
and there's Asperger and there's um ASD, I mean not ASD, ADHD, where they're hyperactive. Yeah. They move a lot, they can't sit still, where there's others where they can't build up the strength to move. They're always lazy. They're yeah. always to themselves. So it's just so many different spectrums of autism. Mm, yeah. Thank you for clarifying that because a lot of people like I say, still struggle with that. Uh, how can other parents become more involved in advocacy for their children with special needs? Um, for me, mm -hmm. um, I think that all we have to do is find a place, your comfort place, like whether it's social media, whether it's TikTok, Instagram. I mean, I'm in Florida and you're not in Florida and we have connected. And mm -hmm. I think that'd be a long lasting connection with your family and my family. Thanks. I think I'll always support you and follow you on your journey as well as you do with me. Yeah. And I think if everyone had that, you know, that community of people that they can go to, I'm a community in Florida, you're a community in Texas, and there's so many other people that have created these communities Find one that you're comfortable with. Find one that relates to you. Find one that makes you feel, okay, they understand me. They get me. They've been through something similar mm -hmm. um, because not everybody everybody fits for you. So you find that community that does fit for you, that does understand you, whether it's social media or it's just in your hometown. Mm -hmm. For me, I would go to my kid's school. I want to go to his school. I want to see what's going on. There's SAC meetings. Every single county, state, district, there's schools um, that have clusters or inclusive programs. All you have to do is volunteer, get involved, get to know the teachers, and they're going to have parent nights. They're going to have different things. And if they don't, that's where you get involved. Hey, let's do a parent night. Let's do a, a play day. Let's mm -hmm. you get involved. You say, hey, you present it to the school. You present it to his teacher conferences. You get involved. And I mean, there's so many things that we have access to in 2024, whether it's YouTube, whether it's TikTok, whether it's just Google, you know, you can Google your nearest autism you know, um, foundations or your autism, you know, nonprofit organizations. There's so many, or even um, Eventbrite. You could just go, you could just type in autism. Mm -hmm. You'll see these events pop up. Go to an event, see who you can meet. You may meet someone who's a long, long time friend. And I mean, um, like I said, that community and that friendship and those partnerships and those communities can, you know, build you up when you're down. They can give you information when you're seeking information. They can provide resources when you need resources, or they can just be a, a, a ball of information when you need it because there's so many things that are going on on in our head as an employee, as a, you know, parent, as a mother, a sister, mm -hmm. a daughter, a father. It's so many other things that we have outside of this diagnosis. So you just need that family or that community that you can come with um, and, you know, get the resources that you need or just that person that you can communicate with because yeah. that's what we're doing. We're just communicating. We're just having open discussions mm -hmm. and that helps so many other people. Yeah. 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 That's true because community is, is everything. And I think even to a degree in 2024, I think we got, I think we got away from that uh, because of our phones and stuff like that. And, you know, communities and as, I mean, when, when I was growing up, you know, everybody knew each other. Uh, everybody knew each yeah. other in the neighborhood. Now we, we really know our neighbors, you know? Exactly. We don't even know them by name. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, that's something I think that we do have the benefit of speaking to people in different states, different countries, even. I mean, since I started my journey back in 2021 of um, advocating about autism, mm -hmm. I follow people in different countries. I'm looking at people. This is people that um, don't speak English, but you see on the bottom what they're mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. and then you're like. God, they go they're going through exactly what I'm going through their son does exactly what my son does and you can write them back and of course you know there's translate yep. it's so many ways you can, you can communicate with people that don't even speak your language mm -hmm. you can communicate with people that don't even live near you you guys um I was just invited to go to Jersey last year to a um autism um conference and it was mm -hmm. it was incredible to know there's so many women in different places that are facing the same challenges looking for resources and i always tell people um autism is new 
you know, it is fairly new. It's only been around 63 years. If I'm, yeah, 63 years. So that first, let's just say 15 years, is trial and error. Yeah. Coming up with the name, trying to pinpoint it, trying to make it make sense, trying to see what do they do that's all the same. Mm -hmm. So we are new. This is new. What we're doing is new because this diagnosis is new. Think about a 60-year-old woman. She's not, she's still riding a bike. She's still <laughs> traveling the world. She's still swimming, right? <laughs> Most 60-year-old people are still out having fun, driving a car. So imagine autism being that new. Mm. They're not old. Autism isn't old. 60 years old isn't old. It's still, you know, fairly new. So what we're doing is fairly new. Trying to get the word out, trying to bring it up in every room we enter is new. Mm -hmm. I've never saw a podcast about autism three, five, three, five, mm -hmm. three to five years ago. I didn't. I honestly didn't. But now that I'm searching, I'm digging, I'm typing it in on my search bar, I'm seeing people with autism in their bio so mm -hmm. yeah yeah let's use our let's use our um internet let's use this new technology to try to like build those connections mm -hmm. that's that's true i love it if you have any questions for our guests please feel free to ask those questions thank you for everyone who's joining us right now i read a stat the other day i was doing some research and on psychology today i'm a big fan of it but they said 80 percent of marriages in when parents have a kid with special needs uh and with autism right and i was like 80 percent that's unheard of and it's psychology today right i mean it's they've been around forever and i that hurt my heart so bad which one of the reasons why i'm doing stuff like this because i think it's uh, very important to you know keep families together because like we need each other during these seasons and trying to help these kids uh, so that was one of the reasons I, I started this uh, what advice do you give to parents who are struggling to communicate with their autistic child because that was a struggle for me me too it's still a <laughs> It's still a struggle. That's the reason why I had to take a deep breath. It's a struggle. It is a struggle. Um, as an educator, I only can use what I use in the classroom, visuals, mm -hmm. visuals, pictures. Instead of saying glasses, hold up glasses. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying cup, show them a cup because a visual related back to a word makes more sense, even for us as adults, because... Um, somebody can say psychiatrist or psych, um, psychologist, or they can say nurse. I mean, do we really know what it is or do we know what it looks like? Mm -hmm. Do we know what we always knew as kids? A doctor wears a white coat. We always knew a teacher wore glasses and was standing behind a whiteboard. But those were the visuals that we received as kids to correspond the word teacher to the actual person. Mm -hmm. We knew a dad was a man standing next to children. We knew him. We, we, we knew it based off the visuals that we were given as kids. Um, and I just think that if we think back to how we were taught with those visuals, we're understanding our kids to another level. Like, hey, I have to put pictures like my son, he has an AAC device. He doesn't use it. He doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to shove it in his face as much as I can because the picture is there and there's a word underneath. Yep. And for example, um, something that I'm really proud of within these last two weeks, I've taught my son to take off his shoes and socks. So every single day I say shoes, mm -hmm. I show him his shoes. And then I say, off. Oh, I pull them off. And it's an act. It's something that I'm doing every single day because he's un he's, he's unable to communicate what he wants. He can, he's unable to tell me, take my shoes off. So what I'm doing is I'm showing him, Hey, you show me what you want. You show me what I, if I say juice, instead of me, you know, going and get the juice, I take him to the fridge where juice is located. Mm -hmm. Um, I take him to the cabinet where his chips are. I show him the chips. I put them in areas where he can be accessible to him. So, um, instead of him saying chips, I show him some those visuals, even with us every day. Remember we stop at a red light because we can see it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say red light. No one's screaming red light because <laughs> guess what? We wouldn't be paying attention. Would we? 
We are looking at our phones. We're listening to the radio. Mm -hmm. We're but we need that visual of a red light to mm -hmm. stop. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, because my four year old, he just started to learn to take his shoes off at the door and take his socks off. You know, so I I get it. That you that's probably good. thought you guys taking your shoes off, so it was still like I'm looking, I'm looking. So let's just show them what we require and show them what we need from them. And we can't expect this is something I've also, you know, as a mom and as a teacher, I tell my parents, we can't expect our kids to um, receive the information the way we receive it. We can't expect them to consume the information the way we consume it. Like my son can be looking at at something completely different. And I'm like, how does he even know what's going on? Like, he knows. <laughs> Maybe don't think because he's not looking, he's not listening. Or don't think because he's not listening, he's not looking, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's so many different ways to receive information. I mean, and I just think that us, we're so used to the typical way of doing things. Yes. But we need to, you know, know that they're not typical. They're not typical. Mm -hmm. Um. Typical kids are called atypical. Um, atypical. I mm -hmm. mean, typical called typical. Autistic kids are called atypical. Yeah, this is this is so good. Uh, I think his name is uh, Bruce Larry Larry Bruce. He says, uh, "Talking about it is very therapeutic, and knowing you're not alone makes the journey easier." Uh, hence why I have special guests like Sharon who can come on here and who really can give a lot of wealth and information and uh again like she said earlier community we we have a community now so i i totally agree with you 100 percent uh sharon there was uh one lady who i was talking to and she was struggling with as her son got older having autism and gaining that independence and you know going to middle school and stuff like that like what kind of advice do you have for those parents who kid may be a little older? Uh and, and then well, what is your what is your age range from your business? Do you have a certain age range or is it just anyone on on the spectrum? Any age um, spectrum? When I initially thought of sharing with Sharon, I was just thinking about sharing information. I never thought about an age. And this is great. I'm so grateful for this question because I didn't think about my son being a middle schooler. I didn't think about my son being an adult. I didn't even think past three years old or 18 months at that time. But I have met families and parents who have a child who's five, six, four, three. Um, but I've really never put any thought into the older kids only because I feel like if we did the early intervention, we've created that community. We know that community and that community follow. Just like I said, we're going to have, you know, each other's contact for years to come. So in my mind, we'll be in a better space than we are now while our kids are in elementary. Mm -hmm. So I'll have more resources. I'll know more people. I'll be in a better community because middle school is, you know, in the middle of their life mm -hmm. or not even the middle, a little bit further than um elementary school mm -hmm. so for me it's like I've already built that community I already know these people I already know what school is going to go to because I've been a part of the school meetings I've tried to make sure I go to as many free events in my you know in my um city as I can so I really didn't think past you know the first stages but the advice that I can give someone who has a child who's in middle school is community 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 all because you're not the only one raising a, a child that has grown past one stage. So there's going to be somebody who knows I have not reached that point. I'm not in that, you know, that area or that arena as of right now. What I do know is, what I do know is my community, for example, your son is older than mine. Yeah. I know that you'll be able to give me some advice once I reach that stage because we have built that relationship. Your your family will be able to help my family. Your yeah. family can probably give me resources that another family couldn't because we're still going to be helping the ones who's going through the two-year-old, the three-year-old, the four-year-old once our child gets to middle school. So um, it goes back to that community, that foundation that you started in elementary school, because normally um, you'll get a diagnosis way before middle school. Yeah. So um, what I would say is 
Get in contact with what's going on in that school setting still. Still get on Eventbrite. Still get on social media because a middle school family is looking for that, that, that resource group. Just like us elementary or preschool parents. And um, me, I, I'm looking to find more families, you know, the high school groups, the middle school groups, so I can, you know, provide more information, have more schools, no more inclusive teachers that teach the older groups because I haven't met any yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a great answer, because like you say, community is important um, because because uh, for some for some odd reason, we think our kids are just going to stay kids forever. I mean, we know they're going to get older, but we just see them at this stage, you know, and it's just like my baby. And eventually they end up getting grown and stuff. So let alone having to deal with autism and even what the world is going to look like 20 years from now, you know, who knows? Uh, th this has been a phenomenal show. Great information. Uh, as we get ready to close out this show, what is one piece of advice you can give to parents um, who they just might be in a difficult season right now. Like they just don't know what to do. Um, they're struggling with even some of the questions that we asked earlier, like what piece of advice can you give them uh, just during this time? Maybe they just got the diagnosis. It seems like every interview we end with something that makes me emotional. And this is that. This is that ending that always makes me or I probably have you found yourself emotional at, it, at these times where you're like, what can I tell another person that's experiencing what I'm experiencing? And I always say, you know, there is value in the valley. There is so much purpose behind our pain because we're confused. We're we're seeking help. We're trying to find that community. We're trying to find that fit. We're trying to make sure people treat our kids right, you know, treat them with respect. We leave them and trust them with individuals for six and seven hours a day. And the piece of advice I can give is, you know, Trust that your your purpose will come out of everything of this. You'll get the knowledge you need. You'll get the community you need. You have to just trust that process. Just know there's value in everything that we're going through. We were meant for this process only to help someone else. And love your children regardless of how difficult. Because I, I was in a state where I was upset. Like, mm -hmm. why me? I don't want this. I don't want this diagnosis. I wanted my son without the diagnosis, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, I just can say, you know, you got to have that hope. You have to have that trust and that faith and know that everything's going to work out. This is a season. One, one, one behavior stays for a season. And then they grow. You get through these transition and these milestones. My son would bite and he would bite and he would bite. And we are easing out of that, you know, that behavior. That behavior is slowly being ch changed into something different. And yeah. it doesn't last forever. Those small seasons of, you know, smearing the poop and mm -hmm. spitting on the floor, it's not going to be always you know get some aba therapy don't be afraid don't be shamed get the help that you need um talk about it talk about, even if you got to record yourself talking about what you're going through that day and remember back and go back to those videos and say wow i don't go through this anymore my son's not biting anymore he's not running out the house anymore you know, you know, um, take it one day at a time and remember every single milestone doesn't stay there forever because my son was not walking. And the reason why it makes me so emotional is because I remember the kid that he is now. I was waiting for him to be a walker, a hugger, a kisser. I wanted that affection. He's slowly becoming more and more of what I, you know, pray for that I ask God for. So it's like, you know, those things we're going to, it's going to, it's going to blow over. It's going to surpass, you know, with help and consistency and visuals. Um, it's not going to be easy. Stay, you know, stay in it. Don't give up. Take those self care days, love your child to the fullest. Try to get as much knowledge as you can. Even if it's just small articles to read YouTube videos, you know, um, you can't ever know too much. Mm 
Yeah. You can't have too many people you're listening to. You can't, you know, so get what you need, get what you can to fulfill yourself with, you know, the resources that you need. And, you know, just trust that process that things are going to get better and you're not in this alone. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I love that. Thanks for the encouraging words because it can be challenging because I know for my four year old, uh, his process is, is just taking longer and he's just starting to talk. Um, and it was something that we prayed for, you know, so um, remembering it's just a season and being able to get through that season and just making that progress. And as they get older, you know, and just having the faith that things will get better and that, you know, they just because they learn different doesn't mean, you know, you, you're learning, too. You know, exactly. because there's so much stuff I've learned just from doing this. Uh, this series have helped me so much with the people that have uh, been able to be a guest. So I was definitely excited for have you on because I knew you had a wealth of knowledge. So thanks again so much for being a guest. Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you because I'll have everything linked in the description below. But uh, tell us how we can follow you on social media. Tell us about the business and website, all that good stuff. Um, my social media is sharing with Sharon, which is my Instagram. That's also my TikTok. And that's also my Facebook sharing S H A R I N G W Sharon S H A R O N mm -hmm. sharing with Sharon. Um, you'll always see like a little logo, pink and yellow, um, that's all my platform, sharing with Sharon. And if you were to go onto my social media, you'll always see different links for my, you know, my um, website, which is in process of being revamped. You'll be able to see my website. My events are always posted on um, social media. Like if I'm having an event, family fun day, swim safety day, resource fair day, you'll be able to see all that. Cause I post about it and I talk about it prior to it happening. Um, any of my interviews, I always post them. So you'll always see those things on social media. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, thank you so much. Once again, Sharon, you've been a phenomenal guest and all the wealth of information that you brought. Uh, so thank you once again, if you are watching this via YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button, share this with someone, share this with a parent, a, a, a friend. You just never know. Uh, we had someone here on our IG live that their grandson has autism. You just never know. So when you get to watch this video, share this with someone. If you are listening to this via podcast, make sure you leave a rating and review on Apple podcast. Uh, we would definitely appreciate the feedback. This is Sean Heineman, and we have discussed autism beyond the diagnosis. Thanks once again, Sharon, for being a guest, and we are out.